Test, test. Is this too loud? Is this too loud, everybody? No? Cool. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Jubilee Shores United Methodist Church continuing life studies on Revelation. Um, so as a reminder, for those of you who are joining us online, if you have any questions, just put them in the comments, and Greg will relay them to me. Um, if you have at the tables any burning questions, ideas, suggestions, thoughts, that's what those white pieces of paper are for. Um, just write it down, fill it out, and give them to me or to somebody, and we will get to them. Uh, I do have a couple of quick announcements. Um, next Wednesday is uh, Ash Wednesday, so I hope you all come to our Ash Wednesday service at 6.30. We'll, we, we will be dispensing ashes and having a, a special contemplative service with a lot of prayer and silence built in um, to mark the occasion of Lent as we prepare ourselves for the harsh days to Calvary, but then the glorious resurrection on Easter Sunday. So next Wednesday, no... Um, Life studies uh, here, just a, uh, just a, but come join us for our uh, Ash Wednesday service. No dinner, right? No nothing. Just, just come at 6.30 and worship like they did in chapter 4 and 5. <laughs> also, I think um, Emily has put this on our Facebook page and our web page. Um, if she hasn't, she will uh, before the week is out. Um, how many of you have heard of a theologian named Barbara Brown Taylor? She's a rock star. She is an incredible woman. She's had, I don't know, 30, 40 books in print. She's now a retired uh, pastor with the Episcopal Methodist Church. And uh, she's a, I think she's a uh, professor. At, um, where is Barbara Brown? Is, isn't she a, a professor now? Episcopalian, and she's at Piedmont College. Anyway, um, she's one of mine and Mona's favorite uh, theologians. She's a great orator as well. She'll be at uh, Dauphin Way United Methodist Church in Mobile on Sunday, March 27th. Um, she's doing the, the sermon for the 1030 service. Um, Emily made a joke, said, why don't we just rent a bus and just tell everybody we're going there for church Sunday? <laughs> I was like, I wish. <laughs> Um, but uh, she's also going to be having a lecture uh, that evening at 5.30, um, Learning to Walk in the Dark is the title of her presentation. Um, she's really good. She's a great speaker, very, very deep Christian, 
Um, so if you are interested, again, this information will be on our webpage and our Facebook page if it's not already. But I invite you to come. We'll be there at 5.30 for sure. Okay. Honey, you want a chair or something? Okay. Well, welcome to my world. <laughs> uh, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Once again, God, we thank you for this time. Uh, be with us during this uh, short and brief hour-long session as we dive into your word, as we dive into Revelation. The visions of John, that can be scary, if not nightmarish, or both. Fill us with the will to listen. Open our ears to hear what you would have us to believe. What is meant behind John's words and John's visions and John's images. For one reason only, so we can know you better and better follow in the footsteps of your son. We pray all this to your name, through your Son, and through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> so we were going to try and get through 8 through 11. That ain't going to happen. <laughs> so uh, we're probably just going to get through 8 and 9. We might touch on 10. But there's a fair amount of stuff in those two chapters. As I hope you read a lot of the images, uh, a lot of the visions. Um, and it's circular in the sense of, you know, what was said about the uh, seven seals is almost kind of in this, in being repeated by the seven trumpets, and they'll once again get repeated, but from a different angle with the seven bowls, which we'll get to in chapter 15. But as a real quick review, let's real quickly just kind of race through the first, um, well, I mean, sorry, not the first, but chapters four through seven. Remember, John is still in um, the thro God's throne room, I'm not sure you can see it that well, but that's a, a pretty good image, I thought, of God's throne room with the four beasts and the 24 elders and the thrones and this magnificent light and all those things that are going on. Um, we are introduced to the scroll with the seven seals um, on it as well. And John hears, and it's important, John hears that the only one worthy to open it is the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, who has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. But what does John see? Does John see a lion? Does John see a conquering general of some sorts or anything like that at all? Not at all. He sees a lamb, which seems to be slain, a lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered. Um, and that, I thought, was a pretty good representation. You had seven eyes. You got two eyes on the lamb, then the five overhead, the seven horns, um, the cutthroat. Kind of visual imagery. They're kind of hard to get rid of. Um, then we have the first four seals are broken. And what are the first four seals? That's a question, y'all. What are the first four seals? The four horsemen. David Roll said, I love you. Look at that funky picture, the four horsemen, okay? Those are the first four seals that are broken. And then the fifth seal is the martyred souls that are underneath the altar who are given white robes and crowns and stoles and everything because they held fast. And then the sixth uh, uh, seal, couldn't really find a good one of this one, that's like Exodus-like plagues. It's, you know, earthquakes and the black sun and the moon and the, the blood and falling stars and all these plague-like images are the sixth seal. And we read of the encouragement being offered to those undergoing persecution. Again, remember John's audience. Remember the context of where we are. We're in the Roman Empire during the reign of Emperor Domitian. And we're also given a vision of a heavenly reality of salvation, not for a few people, not the 144,000 that John heard, but rather as a great multitude that no one could count, celebrating God's victory and their own deliverance with God himself looking after them and protecting them. And chapter 7 ends with a very tender and loving note. I'm not sure if you caught this or not. I know I've told a few folks about it throughout the day. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from 
their eyes. That's a very intimate word picture. It's a very intimate promise as well. And it speaks volume about who God really is. Now, there's no doubt these chapters describe and talk about an angry God. But rightly so, I would say. I mean, who wouldn't be, if you were in God's shoes, obviously metaphorically, In my opinion, he is rightly angry with all those who deface his beautiful creation, take it for granted, and abuse it by oppressing and treating unjustly the weak, the orphaned, and the widowed, those without power and those without voice. We should be angry and understand why God is angry. And I would offer that the reason he is angry is not that God is an angry God, is mercy. He is so full of mercy that his most characteristic action, what else could God do but to come down from his throne in person, in Jesus, wiping away everybody's tears. See, learning to think of God like that, with that as your image of God, rather than some faceless, kind of violent celestial celestial bully who's just waiting to bring havoc, that's one of the most important ways to approach the Bible is to see God in the way I just described him, filled with mercy and love, who wants to come and wipe away our tears and everything that that encompasses, taking care of us and protecting us and being with us intimately, not just distantly. It's one of the most important ways to approach the Bible. It's one of the most important ways to approach with our neighbor. Embracing the reality of God and who God is. Mercy, love, grace. So now we're getting to chapter 8. And now all this time, what's John been doing? He's been building us up. He's been getting momentum, building up and building up and building up. All this worship and all this praise and images of words of destruction, but they're all surrounded by revelation, finally, of the seventh seal, and the Lamb opens it, and what happens? It's silent. It's silent. Wow. What great artistic writing, by the way, of John. We have all this anticipation. Finally, the seventh seal. What's it going to be? All this silence. N.T. Wright wrote a beautiful... There's a story um, he read about something similar that happened to a uh, British uh, writer. And he wrote, But on one occasion, at the end of a recital of Schubert songs by one of the finest singers of the day, so this big old orchestra, this beautiful singer, this beautiful place, and he or she is just hitting it, and it's beautiful and inspiring, and all those things. And he described how the audience at the end, simply still in silence, got up slowly and left the concert hall. The spell of the music, the magic of that moment had been so powerful that nobody dared to break it with anything so mundane and trivial as clapping. He continues, such moments are precious and rare, not simply the absence of noise, I'm sorry, and remind us in our noise-soaked world that silence can be not simply the absence of noise, but a profound, still, deep experience in which one can sense aspects of reality which are normally drowned out by all that noise, noise, noise. That is the spirit in which we should hear what John has to say, he writes, that when the land opened the seventh seal, his phone rang. And... (laughs) Uh, John has to say that when the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was a sense of awe. 
The otherwise ceaseless praise of the four living creature dies away. The songs of the elders, the angels in the huge, countless crowd fall quiet. Everyone seems to be holding their breath. And he finishes it by writing, This, we sense, is the moment they've all been waiting for. We watch, hardly daring to breathe ourselves. That is what is in those words. Silence. Also, this unexpected hush in heaven should tell us something. And that something turns out to be a warning. It's a hush-filled warning. Telling us in a sense, as kind of N.T. Wright wrote, catch your breath, hold on, something huge, something powerful, something here it comes. And indeed it is. Indeed it is. But again, the way, which is John's style, the way must be prepared. So to begin with, in chapter 8, we are introduced to the next cycle of seven. Remember, it's seven, seven, and seven. Seven is all throughout the book of Revelation, and I hope you have your number cheat sheets with you, again, to remind you of what the number seven and thousands and millions mean. Um, let's see. After the, the sea, isn't that a great picture? The seven trumpets. The trumpets were used for various things, again, in context of John's audience. They were used in festivals, and they were used for worship. They were also used in, in battle, what probably is the most famous battle in the Bible that involved trumpets and horns. Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. They're also used as a warning and to sound an alarm, as found in Joel uh, chapter 2, verse 1, or Amos twice, chapter 2, verse 2, and chapter 3, verse 6. And it's the alarm, the warning aspect that I think is the best fit for this now. The trumpets bring forth great plagues, echoing or mirroring sometimes the plagues of Egypt when God did what? Rescued Israel from slavery. What is God, through John's writing, trying to get the point made to us? Salvation, which also means to rescue, can be had for those who hold fast to his teachings. So there are the seven trumpets, and below each one is a real quick description of what the seven trumpets cover. Uh, the first trumpet, when he blows it, talks about the green grass and a third of the trees are burned. Lots of destruction. The second horn blows. A third of the sea becomes blood. A third of ships and sea life are destroyed. And, the and, and these happen real quick. I mean, there is a sentence or two for every one of these. They're boom, boom, boom. Right, you know, left punch, left punch, left punch, and then come the three right punches, for those of us who are right-handed. Uh, the third one, um, a third of the waters turn bitter. Fourth one, a third of the sun, moon, and stars do not shine. Even the heavens are not saved from this. The moon, the sun, and the stars are also affected. Now, horns five, six, and seven, trumpets five, six, and seven get opened a little bit later, and they're also sometimes called the three woes. If you've been reading along, there's that verse that... Uh, John writes before the opening of 5, 6, and 7, woe, 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 um, is in there. But before we get into that, what do you think is up with all this destruction? I mean, a third of everything is being annihilated, blocked. Why? Why? <laughs> Why a third? God wants to give the others a chance to repent. The two-thirds who, who weren't killed are going to die from no, no third sunlight and third of vegetation. That's a great possibility. What else? Okay, what Susie said was her study Bible says that a third is a lot. 
but it's limited. It's not going to wipe everybody out. Kind of like what Robert's saying, to get our attention. It's an attention getter. What does your cheat sheet say about the number one third? For all those reasons, you could also look at possibly playing with the idea of a third is a third of three. Is three an important number for us? So, but the destruction, all this destruction, and it comes, boom, 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 boom. I mean, like in 16 sentences, we have all this destruction. Why do you think? Well, there once was kind of cheeky, if, if you will, um, and the sign read like this. Many people want to serve God, but only in an advisory capacity. I get it now, because I want advice too. <laughs> but only in advisory capacity. I mean, wouldn't we all literally like to be kind of like, God, stop, or God, don't do it? Maybe being like Abraham and say, God, stop. I mean, we've just been bathed in these wonderful words of praise and love and worshiping God and his goodness and his power, his creation, which he deemed good and loves. From our standpoint, how can he turn around and just wipe it all or a third of it all away again, similar to the Noah story? This meaningless destruction of a third of the trees and the Indeed, would we want to advise God from a, yes, I have a question. That this is what, this is all a vision, this is all a vision. Yes, but for it to occur, but yeah. Um, yes. There, even even with all that, there are many rebels. That still would not. Oh yeah, we get to that. We get to that, which kind of echoes going on the whole plague Exodus storyline. Who else didn't repent or soften their heart? Pharaoh. But we'll get to that. Okay, um, so again, um, N.T. Wright offers, I think, three ideas that, that may help with this vision. I don't agree with all three of these. As, as um, The third one I do, the first two, eh. But I, I want to present it to you and let you make your own decisions. One of the reasons for all this destruction and violence might be perhaps is our not taking the seriousness of sin seriously. Oh, don't worry about it. God will forgive you. Whatever it might be. So his first point is, is not taking the seriousness of sin seriously. The second possible explanation, as always in Revelation, we'd be wise not to make to mistake symbol for reality. This is all symbolism. This is all vision. John is writing symbolically, talking about God's drastic action to purify the, the world. And the example he gives is the vine story. It's, it's like the cup the rest of the vine might be saved. I, I, not my cup of tea, but it might be for you, and that's fine. The one that I lean towards is this one, the third one. Again, remember the context of this letter. And remember the great oppression these people are under, under Domitian and previous Caesars and future Caesars. Great oppression that John's people are under. I think perhaps John is pointing his readers to the hope of the Exodus story. He's bringing the Jews back to that story as their anchor for hope and for rescue and for courage. These plagues are a retelling, or at least an echoing, of the plagues which God brought down on the Egyptians to end the Israelites' 400 years of slavery. And what saves them from the final plague? The killing of the firstborn son, 
what saves them? The blood of the Lamb. What has John been talking a lot about in these first few chapters? The Lamb. The Lamb who seemed slaughtered. The Passover story is throughout this entire book. Remember the audience. Jews would have known this story like, I don't know, we know the Revolutionary War or something, and they would just know it. And just by these references, it brings all that back. God's plan of rescue. Now, obviously, John is not repeating the plagues or some of them that match up exactly, but the message is clear, I think. And it's capped, believe it or not, I think, with the rescued people, the, the multitude of countless people singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb in chapter 15, verses uh, 3 through 4. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Great and amazing are your deeds, Lord the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Lord, who will not fear and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your judgments have been revealed. I should get an amen for not singing that, by the way. So that's what I think the point of this story is, is John's trying to remind the Jews and Jewish Christians and Gentiles, who I'm sure knew the stories, I have to imagine did, this is kind of like the Exodus story. God's got this. God's going to come and rescue us. We don't know when. It was 400 years for us with with the Egyptians. Who knows? It might be 4,000 years or 4 million years or whatever it might be. That makes the most sense to me. Doesn't have to do to you. That's just the one that fits. And it, it to me is more. Any questions or anything in, in there I didn't cover, you want to cover more deeply? All right, so chapter 8 ends, as I was saying before, um, telling us, whoa, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. You thought it was scary and violent and bizarre. (laughs) Revelation chapter 9, and I'm going to read verses uh, 1 through 12. And I, again, am reading from the NRSV. Chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. Let these words wash over you as you read along and listen along. And the fifth angel blew his trumpets, and I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to earth. The bottom was pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace in the sun, and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, And they were given authority like the authority of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to damage the grass of the earth, nor any green growth or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Remember last week we talked about how God told the four winds to stop because they had to go around. They were allowed to torture them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torture was like the torture of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. In appearance, the locusts were like horses equipped for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces, their hair like women's hair, and their teeth like lion's teeth. They had scales like rushing into battle. They have tails like scorpions with stingers, and in their tails is is the power to harm people for five months. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he is called Apollyon. The first woe has passed. There are still two woes to come. That was... 
the first woe. There's two to come. So, one word kept coming to my mind as I was reading this section of chapter 9, trying to just come up with an image or something to, to share with you. And the one word that came up to me, honestly, was nightmare. Because that's some messed up feces. I mean, look at that. Some kind of a scorpion-like thing with the head of a lion and teeth and a scorpion tail, and they just come around to torture for five months. Not kill, just torture, to the point that people wish they were dead. And see, John describes these quote-unquote super locusts with more detail than any other creature in this vivid book. So much so, and you may have heard this from previous readings or people, that many have tried to interpret them um, in modern times as some kind of military machinery. Have you ever heard of anybody talk about these locusts, that they attack helicopters of the American um, Air Force or Navy, whatever? You know, those kind of things. See, to me that's just an example. And, and so that and other honestly baseless interpretations only add to the confusion of what John is trying to say. There is no, there's no foundation to say that this is uh, the future, 2,000 years later, uh, the Apache attack helicopter. What's one of the golden rules of interpreting Scripture? Could never have meant something it could never have meant back in its day, back in its context. So that's why I call it baseless interpretations. Regardless, though, not getting so wrapped up into what this image is or isn't, what it could mean or not mean, is missing the point altogether. The point, family, is the nightmare. That's the point. Our worst dreams realized in a moment. The point is, I think, not so much that the fifth angel has unleashed something truly monstrous and hellish inside all of us. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you were to look up that term in Greek, bottomless pit, it means abyss, a deep place, the underworld, the abode of the dead, and demons, unfathomable, unfathomable death. Modern scholars have, as an analogy, has likened it to a black hole. Basically, it's a place of anti-creation, anti-matter, of destruction and chaos, a place of death, a place where even light can't escape. Jesus himself spoke of the way in which all kinds of wickedness, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, treachery, debauchery, envy, slander, pride, and my favorite, stupidity, I wish that were a sin, I really do, <laughs> came bubbling out of the depths of what? The human heart. For the guys who are in the Matthew Bible study, what did we just read yesterday? It's not what goes in your body that defiles it's what comes out of your body that defiles. So what comes out of that black bottomless pit? Smoke. And then what comes from that smoke? The super locust. All those things that come from down and deep within. So I think what John is talking about is that bottomless pit or black hole inside all of them, which is what locusts do. Uh, but these locusts are not to do that. But, and most importantly, at, at least to me, they're not to harm the people who have been sealed by God, only those not marked on the forehead. Again, this is symbolic, family. This is symbolic. I'm hoping that it's, it's bringing you back or hearkening back to our discussion about the mark that people received if they went to worship the emperor so they could go into the trade center and buy and sell goods. It's a direct link back to that. Also note that their work, how horrible it is, is limited to five months. Why five months, do you think? 
It's an odd time period, isn't it? Why five months? I really just wanted a glass of water, so. Because five months, quite. So, no real big secret there, but it's kind of interesting. Um, see, I, I would offer that the underlying point to this vision, again, in harmony with the rest of the book, is John wants us to know that God and the Lamb are sovereign, and for evil to be conquered, it has to be made known. It has to be allowed to come out and do its worst. I think what John's asking us to do is coming out, and, and it, for his audience, it's idol worship, which leads to evil. Any clarity needed on that? Questions? All right, so the first woe has passed. Whew. Thank God. Maybe not. You get this is the next, the trumpet, trumpet number six. So let us read nine now, 13 through 21 for this vision. Just when you thought it was safe. Lions and tigers and bears. <clears throat> Chapter 9, 13 through whatever I said. The end. I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels were released who have been held ready for the hour, the day, the month, and the year to kill a third of humankind. Yay. The number of the troops of the Calvary was 200 million. I heard their number. And this was how I saw the horses in my sulfur. The heads of the horses were like lions. Lions' heads and fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues, a third of humankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. Their tails are like serpents, as if it wasn't bad enough already. Having heads, and with them they inflict harm. The rest of humankind, this is to what you said before, Karen, the rest of humankind give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their fornication or their thefts. That picture is, I think, is about as close as that vision. You have these horses with lion heads. Those look more like lasers, but fire and sulfur coming out. Millions and millions and millions of them with millions and millions of riders just wreaking all kinds of havoc once again. What's your take on this? There's no wrong answer because nobody knows really, but I'm just, I want to hear. Mm -hmm. Some say it's a meteorite. Robert? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are stiff necked people, ain't we? Maybe I shouldn't be glad that stupidity is not a sin. <laughs> but again, that ties back to Pharaoh. Pharaoh wouldn't bend, wouldn't bend, wouldn't bend. The plagues got worse and worse and worse until death came. And then he cut him loose, but then he changed his mind again. Yeah, 
If it weren't improper, I'd kiss your forehead right now. <laughs> as horrifying as this vision is, and I'm only talking about this vision, as nightmarish as it is, as bizarre as it is, family, when you get down to it, it really is nothing new. Now, how can I say that? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> Cliffhanger. Armies massing somewhere on some border, and the propaganda machine is in full swing. Fear is increasing, being fostered and uplifted. I mean, right now, today, where are armies amassing on the border? In the Ukraine. In the Ukraine. It's been going on forever. Before that, what do we have? The axis of evil, referring to the Middle East. And before that was the Iron Curtain and the communist armies. Of the, 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 the World War I and World War II. And on and on and on, back through time in the 1500s, you had the Turks, and they were the terror of the world. Oh, my gosh, for those people. All the way back to Rome. This is nothing new. This is nothing new. And I think what John, again, in his context, is referencing is that, the Roman Empire. So a little bit of background. Biblically, Eastern border was supposed to be, believe it or not, the Euphrates River. And I'm not saying that. The Bible is saying that. Exodus 23 and Psalm 72. They never got that big. Who did? The Roman Empire. About 60 plus years before the birth of Christ, their northern um, border was the Euphrates. So when John writes of the four angels tied where? At the Euphrates, 200 million man Calvary. Calvary. Ready to be released, chomping at the bit to bust over that line, that border. They want to come. I think he was reminding Jews and Jewish Christians, and even the Romans would have been aware of this, but particularly the Jews and Jewish Christians, of what Israel could have and should have been had they been obedient Exodus again. I think he was also tapping into everyone, including us today, everyone's worst political and military nightmares. The hordes are gathering. They're coming to take us away. The hordes are gathering in monumental numbers, and they're all nine feet tall, and they have lightning bolts coming out of their backside, and all these things that we have used to describe them and others and the enemy throughout history, throughout history, and destroy everything that we hold dear. Sound familiar? Now his vision is unusual, but the plot behind it, it's happening today. It's happening right now. But importantly, family, and I'll be saying this again and again and again, I invite you and I remind you to remember that these are, are symbolic visions. Drawing on one horror fantasy after another, purposefully using hyperbolic images of escalating terror and escalating torture. It gets worse and worse and worse before it gets better. But to what point is the question? To what point? Well, as found in verses 20 and 21, to challenge us, to push us, to nudge and prod humanity to repent. That evil emerges from idol worship, from idolatry. You know that saying that we have as from kids on up, you are what you eat? I think what John is t trying to tell us, similar to what David said, you are what you worship. 
Do you worship money, power, fame? Do you worship? So, as written earlier, if we are to worship the lifeless idols, the blind, deaf, and dumb, the, the wooden, stone, whatever, gold idols, guess what happens? You are what you worship. We become blind, deaf, dumb, lifeless in that sense because the bottomless pit is spewing up smoke in our world around us, whether we know it or not. That is the thrust, I think, of what John's trying to lead us towards. Idol worship. It'll kill you. You are what you worship. So be thinking about that. Be thinking about the bottomless pit. Be thinking about the black hole that is inside of us, remembering what Matthew wrote. What is coming out of you, Mike? What is coming out of you, Mo? What is coming out of you, Melanie? What is coming out of you? Is it words of love and affirmation? Is it supporting your neighbor even when it's not convenient? Even when it may cost something? Even when it may be sacrificial? Or are we so turned in on ourselves, a.k.a. idol worship, that we allow smoke? I think we'll stop there before we get into chapter 10. That's a lot to take in. I think that was the last slide. Questions, comments? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, but conversely... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What Tom was saying was looking at this image, we try to understand love, especially the depth of God's love for each one of us. To want to come down and wipe the tears off of your face, Anita, off of your face, Karen, off of your face. Let me come down in person and just wipe away your tears and fill you with encouragement and love. We, we cannot fathom that. And so John offers us these images, which is the best he can do to put words on his vision. But Tom and I had coffee this morning, and one of the things he told fit all of heaven into our brain, it would just explode. And if I'm saying this wrong, let me know. But what we can do, like John did, is we can try and get our head into heaven and imagine and write what it's like. We can't imagine that kind of violence at that level. Again, we've been living with this all our lives, but at that level, he's trying to describe the indescribable. Counter of that is we can't describe God's love either, nor understand it. It just is. Oh, the I keep Tolkien. Of that. Tolkien? Yeah, keep thinking of Tolkien, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to um, Linda and Susie out in the front porch today. By the way, if you haven't been in, in those swinging benches on the front porch of Build and Sea, you're, miss, it, you're missing out. <laughs> it's comfortable out there now. But I was talking to them, and Linda brought a good point up that she uh, went to, was it a Hindu um, place? And there's all these elephants and stuff. And at first she was like, what in the world? But then she sat back and she goes, well, we got a dude on a cross that we kind of wear all around. And, you know, we got this book of Revelation with all of its vision 
and all of its imagery. And I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Right, right, but that, thanks, <laughs> that and the seventh trumpet I have to look forward to, <laughs> all right, let's go to the Lord in prayer, God, once again, we thank you for this time, we thank you for opening your word up to us, as bizarre and as weird as it might sound. Help us to strive and dig as best we can to find your meaning in your words. Help us to follow what we have learned as far as when we're interpreting your word, to keep those questions in mind. Help us always, dear God, to be mindful of our bottomless pits. May it not rain smoke and locust. May it rain with grace and with love. May we be your hands and arms that wipe the tears. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, online folks. No dinner next week. We have Ash Wednesday next week, so just come for service at 6.30 and dispensing of ashes. And um, Otherwise, I'll see you on this Sunday. We're going to be covering Commandments 8, 9, and 10. Can you hit the light?